Good morning, everybody. Come on in. Happy New Year. <laughs> oh, that worked. Look, people running in now. Good to see you all this morning. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to have Rotorua Elam joining us this morning on the stage. We have Valerie and Charles. Um, but hey, Father, we thank you, Lord God, for an amazing day today that you have made. We shall rejoice and be glad in you. For all those that are joining us online, kia ora na and welcome. And this morning, Father, we ask you to use us as your vessels this morning, Father. On the first day of 2023, Lord God, fill us afresh. In Jesus, Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah, Lord. Father, fill us afresh, Lord God, as we declare that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now I've got a special, hopefully you guys know it, but if you don't, you can join in with us, yeah? Um, we're singing it in Māori, <laughs> but there's an English as well. Father, we give you glory, Lord. He honore, he gloria, monga. Worthy is your name. 
Let's all raise our hands to the one and the only Jesus. Father, we honor you today in this place. Father, we just honor for who you are. For all what you have done, but for and who you are to us personally, who you are to us as a church. And Father, we just honor you. We raise our hands to you, Father. We worship you, and we, your name is above any other name, the name above all names. Father, we surrender in this moment. Father, we surrender to you and surrender this new year to you for all what you have for us, for all that you prepared for us. Father, we know, Father, you go before us. You already made a way, Father. Father, and if we face challenges and difficulties, we know, Father, that you are right beside us. You are right with us. And so, Father, we give you already the honor and the glory because you are worthy. You are so worthy. And all the people say, Amen. Oh, you may be seated. A very good morning. A very good morning on the 1st of January. Have a happy, happy new year. But I would say have a blessed new year. It's going to be a great year. Uh, somebody shared this morning with me and said, let it be the year of the Lord. I thought, that is a good one. The year of the Lord. And uh, we can make it any other year, but let it be the year of the Lord. So welcome to church. So good to see you, that you actually made it on this first day, first Sunday of the year. We are very, very happy to see you all. Right, we are ready to worship, aren't we? Let's all be upstanding and give it, oh, where, oh, here we are. Valerie, it's all yours. Thank you. Addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Oh, yes, because your name is power, your name is healing, and your name. Jesus, till every dark day. 
conviction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Oh Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing And your name Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Oh, cause your name is power. And your Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus, oh yes God. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets.
your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire <coughs> father we proclaim your name and every mountain and every valley in this nation, oh God. We proclaim your name in every nook and cranny of every home. Father, in the valleys, on the mountains, Lord, in the country streets, Lord, in the country homes, in the city places, oh God. We declare from the north to the south, from the east to the west. We declare your name this year, oh God, over this nation, Lord, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Father, we declare your a fresh wind of your spirit, God. A fresh moving of your spirit, oh God. Father, we declare your name, Jesus, high above all names. Lord, we declare your name above all names, above all other gods, oh God. Father, that this nation, this year, would know your name, oh God. Your name is power, and your name is healing, and your name is life. Oh, life, oh, life, oh, life. To break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is power, your name is healing. Your name is life, oh life, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great you are, oh God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Come on, give a hand for the Lord with you, Father. How great. How great is our God. You know, as we're in this time of worship, or just, you know, for many of us, when it comes to the new year, it's like there's a switch 
in our mind that we're letting go of yesteryear and we're stepping into the new. Because for some of us, it's like we've had a hard 2022 and we're just like, please God, I just pray may 2023 be better. Right? You ever feel like that? And we're looking forward for the new year because we carry this pain of the year that's just gone. I really felt God wanted someone in this room to know. Will you submit your life to me, says the Lord? Trust in my ways. Because here's the thing, when I trust in myself, not in God's way, and I try to plan and do things my own way, things get messy. So as we step into the new year, let's step in trusting God in every part of our life, in our finances, in our relationships around us. Let's declare that God is great and He's worthy to be praised. And Lord, we're going to submit our lives to you. We're stepping into 2023, knowing that you are with us and that we will trust in you. You know, for some of us, we're still holding on. The Lord will say to you, would you let go and let me in your life today? So Father, we lay it down at your feet and we give it all over to you. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said... Amen. Come on, give a hand for the Lord wherever you are. Praise God. Amen and amen. Have a seat. Have a seat wherever you are. Amazing. Why don't you give the hand for the team? Thank you so much to Valerie and Charles from Rotorua, a part of our, our church there. So good. We, we, we are a church that meets, we're one church that meets in two locations, and here we are together as family, and the world's so blessed, so blessed to be led in worship today. That was amazing. And here's the thing. Every single one of you today, sitting in this room, did you know you have a 100% record of coming to church? You haven't missed a service this year yet. Did you know that? That's right. That's right. The jokes have started and, uh, you know, and uh, did you, yeah, did, yeah, you have not missed a service this year. That's, um, well done. Well done, everybody. Give yourselves a big hand. Fantastic. What a new year. I, I was just thinking to myself, you know, what, oh, you know, what is anyone going to turn up because, you know, Christmas, everyone turns on Christmas because we want to here to celebrate Jesus, but New Year's is a bit different, right? But here we are, we're, we're launching into our new series in 2023, got to get used to using those terms, and the series we're, 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 we're launching back into 2023 is called You Asked For It, You Asked For It, right? And if this is your first time here, first time to our service, and, uh, and you're wondering, what's this You Asked For It series? Well, last month we gave out all these little, little notes and said, hey, if, if, you've, if you've got any suggestions, what, what do you want? heard or spoken about in church. And so this is what the series is. It was where we give you the opportunity to have your say. And today, for you ask for this, the question that someone wrote in, it's, it's a doozy, okay? They wrote this question. I thought, this is a great question. And it's, it's a quite a big, difficult question to ask, especially unpack in this time. And to be honest, I, was, I thought to myself, I, I won't be able to do this justice but I just thought, well, Lord, just let, whatever you lay on my heart, Lord, I, we, we, let me just follow what you want us to hear this morning. And the question is this. How do we answer a person who doesn't believe and says the Bible has many versions and has been altered over time? That's the question. That's the question someone put, put forward. How do you answer a person who doesn't believe and says the Bible has many versions and has been altered over time? And um, you may be sitting in this room, you might be thinking that exact thing, is, oh my gosh, there's so many different versions. And, oh, this is why I, I, I read the King James, because it's the, the authorized version. It's the, it's the one that was really inspired and it hasn't been changed. And, and, and these last 400 years, they've, they've changed the version. And, but the King James, that's the one. What, whatever it is for you. And if you're looking for a title for today's message, it is the authenticity of the Bible. How do we know when we pick up the Bible, when we pick up the Word of God, that it's the same, it's the, it's the same words. It, it hasn't been tampered with, that it hasn't altered, that man hasn't got in here to try and do something, big, and we threw things out we didn't like, and we thought this would be good just to, to, to kind of create a narrative. How do we know what we have in our hands is the Word of God? 
How do we know in our hands that what, what we're holding is what, was, was what they were reading 2,000 years ago? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And, and, uh, and we haven't, honestly, I'm, uh, there, there isn't enough time to sufficiently go through this. But I just want to share what's on my heart about this question, the authenticity, authenticity of the Bible. And here's the thing, when someone, this, whenever someone asks me some curly question, because they've got some random fact to back up this question, this is what I ask in return. I always ask this in return. I say this. This is what I say. And this is probably a little, little clue for you. If someone asks you a curly question that's going to shock you, and maybe you, you take a step back, I always ask the follow-up question, well, how, how do you know that? How do you know that? You're right? How do you, how, where did, where did you get this bit of fact from? Like if someone asks you, about, oh, did you know the Bible believes this? And I was going, really? How do you know that? Have you read it in the Bible? Could you show me where it says that? And, and nine times out of ten, they'll have no idea. They'll just look at you with a bit of a glaze over their, over their eyes. And it's really, and, and it's, honestly, if they're trying to, which is good, people try to hold you accountable, which is good. We should be held accountable. But it's also good for us to hold the other person accountable, Right? Because quite often it's because, uh, how do they, with someone, say for instance, someone asking this question, you know, oh, the Bible's been altered and changed. And my, my natural question is, how do you know that? Who told you? Did you, did you see it in a movie? <laughs> you know? Or did you hear it from a friend? How do you know that? And that's a good question, and this is what we're going to begin to look at. Because when we go down to our local Christian bookstore, we go to Mana Bookstore, Right, and we go to the Bible section, and there's all these translations, right? All these different translations, or well, you've got your Bible app, you open it up, and there's so many translations. You go to your favorite Bible passage, you have a read of it, and then, and then you'll read it in another, in, in a different translation, in a different translation. You open up in the NIV, and I go, oh, this is what it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his, his one and only son. Then you read it in another translation, and the words are different, right? The words are different, and... And you, you'll be like, oh, that's okay because it's a different translation. But for some of us, it's like, ah, there you go. It's been tampered with. It's been altered. It's been tampered. This is why we have all, you know, well, this is why I don't trust the Bible because of all these things that are going on. But here's the thing. The Bible, just like Jesus, is both a human book and a divine book. The Bible, just like Jesus, is both human and divine. The book that we have, meaning that through these human words, God speaks to his people through these human words. And, and when we pick up the Bible, they're very human when we begin to read and, and, and have a look at these things. And some of us have this view of the Bible that, that, that the Bible is like, these, like this golden book that's fallen out of heaven, right? The Bible that we have, and that when, the, when, when it came to writing the Bible, like somehow they got zapped by the Holy Spirit. You know, their, their eyes roll back and they begin to write, right? And when they came to, they're like, wow, I can't wait to read what I just read, right? Like, is this, is this what I mean? Is this, and some of us have this kind of view, and, and that's very unhelpful. And, and, that's not, and, and, that, and that's certainly not true. In fact, what the Bible claims about itself is that it is a thoroughly human book. It's a thoroughly human book with God's words to his people. That's what the Bible claims about itself. That God was involved in guiding by his spirit. It's both a divine book and a very human book at the same time. So we're just gonna, I'm just going to get to the nerdy bit really quickly. Just the nerdy bit. I thought just get into the nerdy bit and then we can move on. And I have to move on because I can stay in the nerdy bit for days. Right? My wife knows this. And so I'm just going to get there really quickly. Okay, now the Bible hasn't been changed. The Bible hasn't been altered or tampered with. With all these different translations, and when we look at all our modern translations today, all our, all our modern, all the different translations are all translated from one source. Did you know that? So all the translations, the NIV, the NLT, the, the uh, GNV, the... Uh, the the ANTS version, uh, that's the ANTS version, in case you haven't, no, just kidding. <laughs> so, right? All these different versions out there, not apart from the ANTS version, uh, all these versions are all translated from one source, right? Both the Old Testament and the New Testament, all the translations are translated from one source. 
Now, for the Hebrew Bible, we call it the Old Testament. You know, if, if, you, if you are a Jew, you don't call it the Old Testament, you just call it your Hebrew Bible. <laughs> it's just that, right? So when it comes to the Hebrew, he, Hebrew Bible, let me show you a picture of a jewel of a manuscript called the Leningrad Codex. So take a look at this. This is the Leningrad Codex. This is, this is the, one of the crown jewels of manuscripts, right? It is, it is the, the oldest complete manuscripts, manuscript of the Hebrew Bible, the oldest complete, meaning all the pages are all together. It's the oldest complete manuscript that we have. It's not the oldest manuscript, right? It's the oldest complete, okay? And it's called the Leningrad Codex, and, and this dates back to 1008 AD. And so, so this is where all our Old Testament are translated out of, right? So this is the basis for all of our Old Testament translations out there. Now, people haven't changed the Bible. It's still the same translation that they're using. People haven't changed it. People haven't altered it. But you, you'll be sitting here and say, well, but it's still a thousand years removed from the time of Jesus, right? Because 1008 AD, that's impressive. Don't get me wrong, but that's still a thousand years removed from the time of Jesus. How do we know that even this Leningrad Codex is the same text that Jesus was re reading when he opened up his Tanakh, the Torah, when he began to read? How do we know this is what he had? Well, this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls are so awesome. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead sea Scrolls were discovered um, over a hundred years ago, uh, just about a hundred years ago, honestly, and you know, they're the oldest texts we have. In fact, here's the oldest of the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls, and, and so I'm going to the next slide. This, this is the Exodus scroll, and it dates 150 BC, right? This is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the oldest, it's the oldest um, text that we have, 150 BC, right? So here's the thing. When we, so we can now do a bit of reverse engineering. Right? If you like, if you like that, we can we can now compare these two texts from the from the Leningrad, which was about a, a thousand eight A.D. to this Dead Sea Scroll, the Exodus Scroll, dated one hundred and fifty B.C. is a thousand year gap. And when you when you begin to compare the two, it's insane of how remarkably similar they are. It's crazy that, w that when we read a scroll that was written one hundred and fifty B.C., a thousand years removed from the Leningrad. Uh, codex, it's, it's, a, it's, it's insanely remarkable how similar they are. That we can totally trust what translation we have in our hands. So here's what Bible geeks have been doing for the last 200 years. Any Bible geeks in this room? Here's what <laughs> Bible geeks have been doing the last two years. Have a, have a, have a look at this. This is, where all modern, well, this is where all modern translations are translated out of. Right? This is called the Biblica Hebraica Quinta. All right, the Biblica Hebraica Quinta. All right, how do I know that's how you say it? Trust me, that's how you say it. <laughs> All right. and, and so there we have, the, and, and you can see the main text there. That's the Leningrad text, right? Yeah, and it's at the above there. So when it comes to, so when, so when you go to these different translation translated versions, this is what these are the texts that they're using to translate the Old Testament. And so you've got their Leningrad text, their, their main text, and see. See, just below that, it's a list. So what Bible nerds have done, they've compiled, they've looked at thousands, literally thousands of, from the Dead Sea Scrolls to ancient, ancient um, manuscripts to ancient translation to, for, uh, from the Septuagint and, and all these things, and they compiled all the differences and they put them down the bottom there. So you can actually trace it. You can trace all the differences. Are there differences? Because, you know, when we compare the two, from a thousand years ago, it's remarkably similar. Are there differences? Yes, there's differences. And that shouldn't bother us one bit. Why? Because the Bible is a human book as well as a divine book. Meaning that God partnered with human beings who make mistakes. Who when it comes to writing down things will miss a word from time and time, from time and time. But here's the thing, we can trace it all. It's all there. There's no missing books in the Bible. There's no manuscript that kind of fallen out of anything. We've got too much of the Bible. It's, there is no literature like it. It is so unique in the world. It's unbelievably unique. It, there, there's nothing like our Bible. We can trust what we have 
is what they were reading 2,000 years ago. And here's the New Testament equivalent of this. And this is called the Nestle's Arlen 27th edition, the same, it's the same thing. And there you go, there's a list of all the variants of all the manuscripts, of all the variants, of every single document that we found that's right there. All our translations are translated from these manuscripts, right? It's, it's not being altered. Man, just the other day, I was writing, I was, I was writing this, this, this e-news, this letter to everyone in church about, hey, this is the year that was. You may, does anybody get that, that e-news that I sent with? Shared with Pastor, uh, we talked about uh, Margaret Henry, he passed away, and all these things. Anyway, I, what I, so when I write these things, I send these things out because if I leave it to my own devices, the grammar's going to be wrong. It's going to be really bad, right? So I send that out, and you know what? All these different r- r- remarks were coming back, and one person said, doesn't quite make sense. In fact, you should say it like this. This person said, you should say it like that. It was the same sentence, but said so differently, right? And we were looking at the same, they were all looking at the original manuscript, my stuff, <laughs> and everyone's giving their own suggestions how I should rewrite that and, and say this. And, 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 then, and then, you know what, I've got a copy of all these little variants that I can follow. But it's amazing. We can trust what we have, that, that the Bible, that what we hold in our hand is incredible. The Bible is not some lost artifact, right? It's not some, there's no secret books of the Bible. Things that have fallen out of it. We can trust what we have. There's no great secret of how our Bible was put together. It's public knowledge. It is so public. We get, we, people get caught up watching movies and think that's exactly how it is. It's kind of like watching, you know, have you ever heard of the movie called The Da Vinci Code? It's a, it's, a fic, it's a fiction story that people believe that's fact. It's like watching Lord of the Rings and believing that's part of our ancient history. Right? That's exact, if you believe The Da Vinci Code, that's what you believe about the Lord of the Rings. Do we believe all movies are true? It's crazy how we can. This is public knowledge. There's no secret. You, you, you get it, even Wikipedia gets this right. Just look it up on Wikipedia. They get it right as well. The, 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 the information out there is, is right out there. We have nearly 6,000 manuscript pieces of evidence for the New Testament alone. That's crazy. 6,000. In fact, take a look at this. Here's the oldest piece of the New Testament that exists. Take a look at this. This is from the Gospel of John. It's dated 125 A.D. 125 A.D. That's 40 years from the original. The original was written down, and, and so that's within someone's lifetime. It's crazy what we have, that, that the early Christians began to write this thing down because they valued it what, when they began to read this, the authority of Scripture. You know, if you, if, has anybody got one of these things? You, do you know what this is called? This is called a book. Did you know that? Did you know it has a spine? And see all these pages that are in there? Did you know that this is a Christian invention? That Christians so valued the text, they want to get as many of these pages put together in one place. That, that in fact, it was Christianity, it was the Word of God that, that pushed the, ever, the technology for writing ahead. This is a Christian invention. The fact we have a book, say, thank, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for our books that we have. Otherwise, we're getting out our scroll. Can everyone turn to the scroll? Hand out the scrolls. Let's go to, right, here we go. And this, this is it. Here we go. Can we trust the authenticity of our Bible translation? Absolutely. The Bible hasn't been tampered with. It hasn't been altered. People ask me all the time, what translation should I read? And here, here you go. Here's my advice to you. If you want to know what translation you should read, here's the advice. Listen carefully. Lean in. And listen to my advice to you. The translation that you should be reading is the one that you are reading. Did you get that? The translation that you should be reading is the one that you're reading. The point is, just read the Bible. Just read it. Have many translations. Have many. Just just get them together. Just read whatever version you have. Read it. You've got the King James. Read it. You've got the message. Just read it. Just read the book. Just read it. It will change your life. Did you know that the Bible is the most illegal book in the world? Did you know this, this is the most... Some countries, having the Bible on your person can mean imprisonment. In some places, it means death. Did you know that the Bible is also the most stolen book in the world? Right? Gideon, who has Bibles in, in hotels and motels, report how, how many books... Are, they proudly report how many of their books are stolen. It's the most stolen book. It's the most read book in the world. People have given their lives that we could have this book in our hands. This book is powerful. 
It's the Word of God. It's, it's thoroughly a human book as well as a divine book. It's human. We can look at it, that God will partner with us, that He doesn't abandon us. And that he, he, he's like, you know, they're going to not get it right, but it's okay. I'm here. I'll, I'll, I'll guide them along. And, and, and don't worry, we're going to have lots of pieces around and things won't get missed. Come on, if you believe that there is a God and, and that God has, has, has partnered with humanity, then we can trust that God knew what He was doing. That what we hold in our hand is authentic, that we, we can trust what we have. That's the authenticity of the book, and I was just trying to be really brief on that. So, so, <laughs> I went way longer than I expected. But here's the thing. I really want to talk about the authority of the book. There's one thing. Okay, this is, okay, this is authentic. This is what they're reading, but wh- what kind of authority does this book have, have over my life? Why should I, why should I hold this Bible uh, as, a, as authoritative over my life? I mean, why was the book even written in the first place? So we're going to be having, just quickly, have a look at the origins of the Bible. Why it was written in the first place. Okay, so pop quiz. Where is the first place in the Bible that describes the writing of the Bible? Right? You might love pop quiz. Where in the Bible, where in the Bible, where is the first place in the Bible that describes the writing of the Bible? And the answer is, of course, you all know this. Exodus chapter 17, right? Okay, no, that's okay. Exodus, so, so here we have the Israelites, they've, they've, they've been, uh, through the leadership of Moses, God uses Moses and he, and, he, and he rescues his people out of slavery, out of Egypt. And, they, and they've gone through the Red Sea and the only way to Mount Sinai, right? And this picks up the story in Exodus 17, verse 8 to 9. Here it is, verse, and then verse 14. The Malachites came and they attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with a staff of God in my hand. Because remember, that, some of you might be familiar with that story where that, you know, there's, there's Moses holding up the staff. And when, were, when, the, when the children of Israel were fighting, when Joshua was leading the army. This is the first time Joshua was mentioned, by the way. Just another fact to throw in there. They're winning the battle because, you know, Moses is getting, getting on. Gets a bit tired, right? And two guys have to hold, keep his hands lifted. And they won a great victory. Verse 14, then the, Lord, then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Here it is, the origins of the Bible, the reason why it was written down. There's, there's no mention of, of Moses, his eyes rolling back and starting writing. No, no, no. What, he, he was doing a very human thing. He just sat down and began to write. He, he, was, he, he, didn't, he, he knew what he was writing. He just began to write it down. The first mention of the Bible being written, why did, why did, it, why did God want it written down? Why did he want it? So that they will remember. Remember how he saved his people. So the first mention of the Bible being written down is so that they can remember how he saved his people. Is this the first time God saved his people? No. It's the second time. The first time is when he saved them out of slavery, out of Egypt. Now, how did God want his people to remember that moment? Through a ritual meal called the Passover meal. They had to eat the memory of what God did for them. That was the first time, the Passover meal. God said to them, okay, for you to to remember this and how I rescued you out of Egypt, eat this meal, the Passover meal. You have to eat to remember how I rescued you. The second time, God said, write it down. Write it down. Okay. Second pop quiz. Where's the second mention of writing in the Bible? <laughs> Exodus 24. Exodus 24, verse 3 to 8. Let's read it. Okay, so now, here they are there. They're at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai. God's about, to, uh, and this is where we get the famous Ten Commandments. Okay. Verse 3. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws. How many laws are there in the Bible? The, the initial ten. 613. 613. Anyway, carry on. 613. When Moses went and told the people all the laws, words, and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. We will do everything he said. Now, do the people do it? No, if you're familiar with the Bible, they don't. 
They don't. Sounds familiar. Sounds like us. Okay, verse 4. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. This is the second mention. The second mention, right? But this time, what's, why is the second reason why the Bible is being written? It's writing down the terms and conditions of this coven, covenantial relationship. That God is entering in a covenant relationship with his people. And Moses begins to write this down. And God, God's inviting his people to live according to his wisdom. Right? So that, why? So that they can be a light to the nations. That as they begin to trust in God and live according to God's way, to be this contrast community, that the other nations will look at them and go, wow. Wow. They can begin to see God in Israel. Wow. This is, what, this, is this covenant relation. And Moses begins to write down the terms of this covenant. Right? He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. And he set up the 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. 12, 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 5. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they, they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as, as fellowship offerings to the Lord. It's incredible when you get into all that, to that system. Verse 6, Moses, Moses took half of the blood and he put it in bowls. The other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, all right? Moses, what he's just written, right? And, and what, what's the covenant? It's, it's the Torah, it's the laws, right? It's the, the terms that they agreed to. And he read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. All right? We will obey. This is what they said. Verse 8. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people. And you'll be thinking, ooh, that's gross. That's okay. We've got the bowls of blood we're going to be bringing out soon. And Here's the thing. This is the only time in the Bible where blood is applied to the people. The only time. It's never applied to the people ever again. Just this one time. And there's another time where blood applied, and that was to Aaron, went onto his earlobe, into his thumb, when he entered into this, this role. Those are the only times blood is actually applied, but it's never applied to people after that. The only time. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Right? So why did the Bible come into existence? Exodus 17, to tell the story of how God had rescued and formed a people. Looking at my font, and I realize my font is not what, what I expected. Exodus 24, right? To invite, these, uh, to invite those people into a covenant relationship with God. So why did the Bible come into existence? To tell the story how God had rescued and formed the people, and to invite those people into a covenant relationship with God. This is why the Bible was written. This is why, why we have what we have. This is the authority of the Bible, where the Bible holds us accountable, brings us to account. See, it's not some rules, it's not a rule book. And this is where we think of this, the golden tablets falling out of heaven, right? That it's like these, these, these rules. It's not that at all. It's not some rules what you should and should not do. If you do these things, you're going to go to the good place. If you don't, you're going to go to the bad place. It's about a relationship. It's about walking in a relationship with God. God said, will you trust me? Begin to walk with me. Enter into this relationship with me. And when you live in this way, when you live in this way, you will be blessed. You know, do you trust me? This is, this is what, what it is. And, and so fast forward, fast forward to Jesus. And, and, and here's the thing. When Jesus arrives, he so cared about his Bible, the Bible. And when we talk about the Bible, we're talking about the Old Testament. He so cared about it, and he constantly was quoting from it. He, he constantly referred to it as the source of divine speech and authority. And when we, when we think about Jesus, for many of us, we're like, you know what, I, end, I love reading the New Testament, but this Old Testament stuff I don't really get. I'll stick to the New Testament. But what, hey, we can't just take part of Jesus. We've got to take all of Jesus. And Jesus howled the Old Testament as part of what, it, of what he said. And, he, and I love what he says. He came and he began to announce how the kingdom of God is here. That God's reign and rule has arrived to rescue his, his goodwill from what we have done to this place. How does he do it? He does it by beginning a, beginning a movement of disciples that culminates with this night before Jesus is portrayed, the Last Supper. Matthew 26, 
Verse 26, this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. Does this sound familiar to you? He's quoting from Exodus. We've just read it. Jesus is quoting from Exodus. Jesus sees himself as bringing in a new covenant people. Jesus ties what he is doing as as forming a people that will bring a light to the nations. And he's inviting you to be part of this new covenant people. Now, what happened in Mount Sinai? Because Jesus is, is reading himself as he's the new Moses. What happened in Mount Sinai? They began to write down this covenant. Now, did Jesus ever write anything? Did he ever write anything down? What did Jesus give us to remember? He gave us a meal. We call it communion. He gave it to us so that we remember, that we eat the memory of what he did for us on the cross. That God so loved the world that he stepped into his creation and he became a human being in the fullness of Jesus. And on the cross, he died for your sins so that you may be free and set and begin to step into the new way of living. So Jesus gives us this meal to eat, the, the memory of what he did for us. But watch how Matthew ends in Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority, there's a word authority, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So why do we accept scripture as a source of God's authority and guidance over our life? Do we give our allegiance to a book? No, we give our allegiance to Jesus. So what we mean when we say the Bible is authoritative is that Jesus has authority over me. And that authority is expressed to me through the scriptures. Because did Jesus ever write anything? He didn't. But what he did do, this is what he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. I'm forming a covenant people here baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Jesus, what does he do? He forms a covenant people, then he deputizes apostles to pass on his teachings. And so when we pick up the Bible, and if you, and if you believe Jesus did what he did for us to set us free, and if we believe that this is the authentic, this is the authenticity of the Bible, then we also got to believe the authority and power that it has over our life. Because this book holds me accountable. Because when I begin to read the words of Jesus, it challenges me to the core. It changes the way that I live. And this is what I find the more I read the word of God, I've become more loving more forgiving. I've become a better version of myself because of the authority of Scripture. So what does it mean for us? Why should we accept the Bible as authority? Come on. We're just going to end with this, this story of why. I was having this conversation just two days ago with this older person. And they're talking about the rise of crime just even here in Hamilton. Ram raids. Anybody concerned about the rise of crime in our community? Ram raids. Blanket daylight robbery. People walking up with trolley loads of groceries. And what this older person said to me was, I found very interesting. This is what they said. They said, that's... They, they, they were, I'm not sure if they're Christian or not, but this is what they said. They said, you can't blame how hard it is financially on everyone. You can't blame that. This is what they were saying. 
We live through a recession. We live through a war. We know what it's like to have no money, yet no one blatantly flaunted the law like they do today. This is what they said to me, and I was like, fair enough, I wasn't there, you were there, I can't say anything, okay. But I started to reflect on what they said. What's the biggest difference between then and now? Back then, most people, most people in society had some knowledge of the Bible. Some knowledge of the Bible. Most people. Today, with the removal of the Bible in our parliament, in our schools, and the ongoing attack on the church, within media is heartbreaking. Remove the authority of Scripture within society, and you remove the accountability. Who would you rather encounter when you're walking down a street on a dark night? Do you want to, do you want to encounter a, a bunch of guys coming out of a gang uh, meeting? Or do you want to encounter a bunch of those same guys who encountered Jesus, whose life is held accountable by the Word of God, and now they're transformed? Who do you want to meet? The Bible will transform your life. It will turn your life the right way up. Remove the authority of Scripture within society, and you remove the accountability. Come on, God loves you. He has never abandoned you. Will you allow him to guide you and being the best version of yourself? So church, we're going to close by remembering what Jesus did for us by eating together. I'm going to ask our ushers to begin to hand out communion together. Jesus calls us to be a covenant people. And when we look at Scripture as authoritative, then it holds me accountable. It reflects, it reflects my behavior. So Jesus gives us a meal to remind us of what he did for us. The next time that you... That you are honestly, I've been there. Well, you don't want to forgive anyone. Jesus, remember, remember what I did for you. So when did Jesus begin to forgive us? When he was nailed to a cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus didn't wait for an apology. He didn't go, wait, hang on, God, I'm just waiting for them to apologize. I'm waiting for them to say sorry. For many of us, even though we're Christians, if you're a Christian in this room, we're like, I'm not going to forgive them until they say sorry. Oh, I forgive them, but I haven't forgotten. Right? Jesus, no, 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 no. Yeah. Come together as a community. Begin to eat and remember what I did for you. And go and do the same to others. Why was the word of God given to us? The origins of the Bible. The origins of the Bible is to remind us of how God saved us. And it invites us to become a covenant of people in a relationship with Him. Doesn't mean that we're gonna we're never gonna make mistakes. No, it doesn't mean that. I mean, we're gonna make mistakes. But it's a relationship. And relationships are meant to grow. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he picked up the bread. He says, this bread represents my body. It was broken for you. Let us eat the memory of what Jesus has done for us. same way he took the cup he says this cup is a new covenant Jesus is inviting you will you be my covenant people let us drink and remember
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that, that you are the human that we are meant to be. And when we read your teachings, it holds us accountable to be the best versions of who you've called us to be. That we are forgiven. That we are loved. And Lord, it's your authority. It's the only authority that I want to be under. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. You know, if you're here this morning, I don't know where you are with Jesus right now. But Jesus is calling you, saying, will you come under my authority? Will you come under my grace? Maybe you've always, you've never given your allegiance to anyone. I'm giving it only to me, myself, and I. Jesus is calling you and says, will you give your allegiance to me? I love you. I'm for you and let my love turn your life up the right way around. If that's you, you need to make a decision. The authenticity of the scripture, the authoritative power of his word. So, Father, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come and give a hand for the Lord wherever you are. Praise God. You know, That's a big question, and seriously, it's also inadequate of how I could explain that in such under time, but I really felt the sheer what was on my heart. If you're here this morning, you're making a decision to follow Jesus, we want to gift you with a Bible. And the way we gift you, and we only can gift you a Bible if you just just fill in one card and tick the box, I'm committing my life to Jesus. We only want you to do that so we can give you a Bible. The authority of the Word of God. That's a... It's a thoroughly human and divine book. And hear the stories of Jesus. It will transform your life. Thank you, Pastor PJ. Can you give a hand for the Lord wherever you are? Thank you, Pastor Enns, for this timely word for us to start of the year. Before we go, I just want to remind you of our vision, Real Love Serves, because God is real and wants to be real in every situation of your life. And that's why we do Alpha, Alpha is about to know God and go in a deeper relationship with Him. And obviously, uh, you use your one card if you want to be part of Alpha this year. And love is uh, also about community. We are not meant to do life on our own, but we do life together much better. And that's why we do have connect groups. And and also, when we are connected with each other in relationships, we find freedom in many areas of our life. And so, again... Fill in one card if you're interested to uh, join or lead a connect group this year. And then serves purpose. It's about, you know, we have a purpose. God has given each and every one of us a purpose to do life. And that's why we have Growth Track to actually discover the purpose that we have. And also, we want you to to put your name down. If you haven't done Growth Track yet, then this is the year for you to do Growth Track. And it will come up soon. And Surf's Calling is about um, we can all make a difference. And we would love you to join our team uh, to make a difference here on a Sunday and maybe during the week, whatever your gift or calling is, uh, we find a place for you. And there is always room for one more on our team. Isn't that cool? That's me to say that we are all, so thank you for your giving. And you can give three ways uh, to Dropbox or information center or automatic payment however it's best for you so that we can keep serving uh, our schools and our community uh, that we have been doing for such a long time and also our missionaries overseas and um, so if you want to know more about us above going to church on Sunday then I encourage you then you sign yourselves up for our email list. We will come out every week, usually on Tuesday, Wednesday, and it keeps you up to date, what is happening, what is coming up, and all that sort of thing. So if you want to be part of that, please use the one card today. We have all the things we talked about, um, and we will connect with you. So, leave me. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for the people who are online today. If you are going on holiday this week, 
I just ask you, drive safely. Drive slowly. You will get there, even if it's five minutes later. But keep safe on the road. Enjoy your holiday with your friends and family. And for those of us who are not going on holiday, just have a great week. If you have to go to work or no school, but go to work, make the most of every day. So, Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you, Father, for the words you've just spoken in our life today. Father, may we take hold of it, Father, and apply them and remind ourselves, Father, that you are our God and you are always with us. Father, we just ask you to watch over us and all our comings and goings this week. And we just thank you, Father, that we could be together today. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people say, Amen. Uh, there's coffee out there or something to eat. Please uh, hang out with each other. It's good to have fellowship. And otherwise, have a great Sunday.